I was posted as a sentry outside the Shire Hall in Nottingham. And I was told to march up and down this beat in front of the Shire Hall. And I looked in a window and I could see this very annoying bloke festooned with cameras marching up and down you know, just like you at the back young man keep going very well swing those arms swing those arms come on arms out there put your thumbs out good boy good boy well done fantastic anyhow i could i could see this man marching up and down behind me and mocking me i thought this bloke was some sort of tourist and there was a great gaggle of younger people with him and I determined from their speech that they were probably French. And I thought, well, I'm not having a bloody Frenchman insult the Queen's uniform, taking the rise out of his Queen's century. And as I turned on the turn, I charged my bayonet and shouted very loudly, Queen's Guard! He leapt in the air as if he was a vertical takeoff aircraft, came down, fell on the other bloke with him and then I could see these expensive lenses rolling in the gutter and to add of my plenty to this I called him a dirty French pig and he should go away in French the sergeant major hearing of this disturbance turned the guard out asked me what had happened I reported properly to him and he said very well, put me back on my beat. I then heard him talking to the guard commander, who was a lieutenant, and he said, whoa, yeah, Mr. Harriman, he sorted them out, yeah, yeah, we'll make a bloody good officer, he can swear in French, you know. One of the things I'd like you to do in a minute when the Daisy and Poppy bring out a cardboard box, because you have brought a, a bayonet with you, haven't you? And, and you're able to do that. Can you, do, can you get a bigger one than that? Can you get a bigger cardboard box, David? <laughs> Look at that. That's fun. Right, talk me through that. It's clearly. <laughs> <It's clearly. laughs> can you talk me through that bayonet? This bayonet is Corporal Jones's very, very own bayonet. This is the bayonet that they don't like it up in, Mr. Jacoby. They don't, so they don't like it up in. It's a, an American pattern of... 1917 bayonet. Uh, please do pull. And it's 17 inches of pointy steel. And that went on either the Patton 14 rifle or the one that the Home Guard were issued with the Patton 17 rifle. To be frank, the Home Guard were issued with everything. But that is America helping the Brits out by supplying it with... There's a man coming up here with a cardboard box. Good Lord. Well, we're going to treat that as a, we're going to treat that as a French tourist. So if you could, could you pop that on the, on the floor and then Bella's going to reenact. Mm. No, you don't have to hold it. Well, that's health and safety gone mad, David. Mm. Thank you very much. Um, Bill, do you think you could um, uh, apply this uh, bayonet? I, I hasten to assure you, ladies and gentlemen, the sock that I've put around this bayonet is clean. <laughs> Clean socks, marvellous. Could you apply this uh, bayonet to what, what have you brought? I bought a Patton 14 rifle. Wonderful. And I'm not quite sure how we do this, but if that were a very small Frenchman, how, how would you then, how would you then uh, approach it if it were mimicking you? This may take a moment or two, so please bear with us. Right, shall I talk through what you're doing? He's unsheathing. His bayonet. The command is X. Bayonets, there's always a 2 3 in every drill to allow the soldiers to do something. Um, on fix, the bayonet, go, the rifle goes between the knees of the soldier. The hand goes round the back, grasps the bayonet, turns it upside down so you can pull it out, and on the command, bayonets, you pull it out. And you put it on. And that is a rifle with. Get out this chair. 
of old, you know. Certainly, <laughs> that is a rifle with a fixed bayonet, held at the high port, which is the ready position to engage any enemy. And you can do the lunge, the butt smash, which is one of the gob, which does a lot of good, I understand. And also the point, the low point, which is... <coughs> oh, God, I'm sorry, I've gone through your floor. <laughs> That's absolutely perfect. Well done. Thank you very much. Can we have a round of applause for Bill for doing that for us? Thank you so much. Um, so, you used very much this rifle, this bayonet, or was it, was it a slightly shorter version? We see the SA-80 with a very small one. Oh, yeah. it, it, was, uh, it was the SLR, which is about as long as this, but the bayonet probably no, no longer than that. But I think it's, as I was just marching up and down, and I turned down and shouted, Queen's Guard, and stuck it right at his breast height. He took... First call take off from Frenchman. Thank you very much, Bill. Right, now do sit down and, uh, and, and, and de-bayonet your rifle if you want to, because we're going to talk about your book. It funnily enough fell into lockdown. It wasn't a lockdown project as such. It had been started before lockdown, but lockdown really enabled me to spend a lot of time and finish it. So it was really rather good. And you are also well known to us from BBC Antiques Roadshow. Have you come across bayonets on the Antiques Roadshow? And has the BBC let you uh, show them off? I have done the fake game with Fiona with bayonets. And I produced three bayonets. She obligingly started the session off by saying they don't like it up and do them, Mr. Mannering. She's a, a hell of a good girl and very, very funny to work with. Absolutely on top of a brief. You, you tell her what, what she's to say and she just remembers it just like that. She, she's an absolute star and not grand at all. And anyhow, I produced three bayonets, one of which was a very agricultural looking Soviet model 1891 1930 uh, bayonet from the Second World War. The other one was a Trapdoor Springfield bayonet from the American 1870s or thereabouts. And then there was one which was a French Longshank bayonet from the 1720s. And I said to Fiona, which is the fake? And she hummed and hard and she did her usual analysis about there not being uh, much rust on this one and uh, that one looked like it'd been finished with a brick because it probably had. Uh, and then she asked the crowd and I thought I think I've got you here and the crowd were all for going for the Soviet bands for being the fake because it, it really did look like someone had made it yesterday but you know it, it defended the uh, Soviet Union from the fascist hordes and it was a proper one from the period and it, it's at the very last moment a young lady in the front of the crowd clearly swayed her by saying, I think it's that one, pointing to the French long shank bayonet. And she said, that's a fake. I said, you know what, Fiona, you got the job. Can you start Tuesday? That's perfect. I don't know if any of you know this, this moment in the Antiques Roadshow, but Fiona Bruce, who is very, very core cool, BBC, is asked to do something which should be very, very core cool, BBC, but with bayonets. I mean, that, that, that's, that's a leap. Um, Bill, I'm going to hand you the microphone now. I'd like you to tell me about the book and, 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 and what, it, what it covers, what it includes, please. Thank you. In, in writing it, I was very much minded that there are obtain books about which tell you how to identify bayonets from sort of Afghanistan to Zambia, A to Z. There's stacks of those. But I wanted to write a book for the Osprey Weapons series which was generic and which dealt with the development and also the tactical philosophy of bayonets. So that, that's the difference. And that, as I see it, there are five phases to the bayonet's life. The first phase is that it was the changer of armies from about 1640 when somebody, probably in the Spanish Netherlands, put 
a sharp spiky thing in the end of his unloaded musket and turned that unloaded musket into an improvised short pike. By the by about 1680 to 1700, the distinction between pikemen who are shock troops with great big long spears and musketeers who were the missile troops who needed the pikemen to shelter them once they were loading their muskets from the cavalry. They were very, very worried about the cavalry and probably with very good, good concern. But you see, by about 1700, that distinction goes and you don't get pikemen and musketeers in the infantry element of an army, you get every infantryman is armed with a flintlock musket and a bayonet because he is capable of dealing with any cavalry attack with a bayonet. And also, it's not just a weapon of self defense, it can be a weapon of offense. And from about 1700 to probably about 1840, it was the winner of battles, providing that the attack was only done over a short distance. So what would generally happen would be there would be an exchange of musketry, the side which produced the biggest volume and the most accurate volume of musketry would cause the opposition to become disordered. They would then launch a bandit attack and they'd just simply run away. Frederick the Great in the Seven Years' War, his troops, the Prussians, they were very good at doing it. They would do probably about a minute's uh, fire, three or four volleys, and then they would rush probably no more than 100 yards with bayonets and the opposition, who were often Austrians, but also they could have been Russians, uh, you, you name it, they ran away very sensibly because a broken formation isn't going to be able to stand against people who are charging them with long pointy things on the end of their guns. And they think, I'm not dying for you, king or not. And they run away. And then the third phase is this completely irrational reliance on the bayonet as being the super weapon of the age making troops invincible that lasted from about 1840 to the end of the First World War. And you got some very, very long attack marches before you could get close enough with the bayonet, particularly in the American Civil War. The Union forces at Chancellorsburg attacked the Confederates who were dug in, i.e. they were in rifle pits, on Mary's Heights looking over the, the city and the Confederates just shot them to bits. They had an approach march of probably six or 700 yards. You think about it, running at a steady jog with full kit, rifle and bayonet, you would be jiggered by the time you got close enough to engage them. But bearing in mind that a rifle musket in competent hands would easily hit a man at 300 yards and a really good shot would pick one off at 600 yards and they, the Union casualties were horrific. The tables turned slightly at the final day of the Battle of Gettysburg in July in 63, when the Confederate Pickett's division attacked the Union forces, who again were behind cover on the top of high ground. They had probably a mile and a half to go up a gentle slope on a hot day, they were probably underfed, underwatered, and when, when the, the, the division was pushed back, General Lee said to General Pickett, sir, where's your division? And he turned around and said, there, and there was just nobody there. It just wiped them out. So there was that irrational reliance on a bandit as a battle winner when you had got quick firing firearms, efficient artillery, and later on machine guns, which really did change things. And then the next phase is the bayonet being a battle winner in really extreme circumstances. You get instances in the Second World War where 
fairly sizable subunits have attacked with a bayonet and have pushed somebody off a position which they couldn't shift them. Interestingly enough, the Japanese in the Pacific War, they relied entirely on the bayonet and their casualties was just horrendous. If you, if you look, at, look at European casualties in any war, you'll find a very small number killed, slightly bigger number wounded, and an even bigger number taken prisoner. But you look at the Japanese and it's reversed. Huge numbers killed, a relatively small number wounded, and virtually no prisoners. And that was that reliance on the bayonet. They were just shot to bits by the Americans because they had automatic self-loading rifles. And then the last phase of the bayonet, which is post-World War II, is that it's there as the very last ditch insurance. And it's often combined with useful things like sort of wire cutters and saws and things like that. It really becomes a combination tool that you can stick on the end of your rifle if you're really desperate. And I think the last time that the British Army mounted a bayonet charge with large numbers would be in 1982 in the Falklands when the Scots Guards, two platoons of the Scots Guards, and one of their platoon commanders is my former colleague and now BAOC council member, Alistair Mitchell, who commanded one of the platoons. They attacked the Argies on Mount Tumbledown and saw them off. They pushed them off this position. Uh, I said to Alistair, what was it like? And he said, mm, it was a bit scary. <laughs> he, he's on YouTube and it's very, very well watch it, worth watching. So do a wonderful interview. Uh, the, the company commander bandited two Argentinians and was about to get stuck into a third when he realized his bandit had broken. What a perfect place to end. But Bill, you're in danger of giving us the entire book there. Thank you so much. It's, it's called The Bayonet. It's Osprey is the publisher. Have you got a copy there? Um, and it, w would we be able to find it at the game fair, do you think? No, you won't find it at the game fair. You get it off Amazon. Have a look on Amazon. Ladies and gentlemen, Bill Harriman and his bayonets. Thank you very much. Bill.